Absolutely. So, good evening, everyone, or you may be outside of the UK, so it might be earlier in the day or it might be later in the day. But I'm delighted to be here joining you for this webinar, and I'm very grateful to the team for inviting me to be the speaker um, on a topic that's very, very uh, important to me. Before we crack on talking about deaf blindness, I think what's very interesting is why do people go into what they go into? Either why do they research what they research or why do they go into that area of practice? I'm sure you all have your own uh, area of social work practice that floats your boat, as it were, that you're really passionate about and, and interested in. So we often find this located in, in personal factors, don't we? And for me, this was very much the case. It was meeting a deaf blind woman that totally changed the course of my career. So back in the 90s, um, I was learning sign language and somebody came from a local charitable organization asking for volunteers to go to a deaf blind club and help out. And I remember thinking, deaf blindness, what Helen Keller, what's this all about? So I duly volunteered and off I went. I, I presume I did a DBS check, a police check, although I have no recollection of it. I just remember rocking up, but uh, let's hope that that did happen. And when I arrived, I was uh, said, oh, great. Can you go and uh, sit with, I'll, I'll call the woman Barbara. That's not her real name. Um, uh, can you go and help her with the bingo. So I sat next to this woman, profoundly deaf blind. She obviously felt my presence, uh, put her hand out to receive tactual communication, touch-based communication. And with my rudimentary knowledge of that uh, tactile deaf blind language, I uh, muddled through a game of bingo and we had a conversation and I was absolutely blown away by the whole thing, by this woman. And I thought then, that's what I want to do. I want to be a social worker for deaf blind people. So I went back to university uh, and did academic qualification in social work and training and became a social worker for deaf blindness. I've now left uh, practice and work in education, but of course my interest in deaf blindness remains. So I'm delighted to be able to speaking to be speaking to you about it today and tonight. So what do we actually know about deaf blindness? What, what do you know about deaf blindness already? Well, the provenance of campaigning organisations for deaf blind people is often found in shared concern about the educational needs of deaf blind children. And so the research community similarly had tended to focus on deaf blind children and their education. And it wasn't really until the 1980s that organisations and the research community began to be interested in other uh, groups, other subgroups of deafblind people. So older deafblind people and those acquiring deafblindness in later life. There are lots of methodological challenges involved in research with deafblind people and that impacts on what we know about deafblindness. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. Sometimes researchers assuming it will be too difficult to involve deafblind people and they simply get excluded. But we are improving, we are learning more about it. But as you can see here, yes, but our mayor said back in 2015 that research in deaf blindness is still very much in its infancy. And we're still, there's lots and lots for us to learn. In particular, there's a certainly a paucity of uh, knowledge, uh, qualitative inquiry. What is it actually like for deafblind people? Uh, what are deafblind uh, people's experiences? Uh, and we don't know very much about the experiences of deafblind people in low and middle income countries either. And so much of the research we do have tends to come from North America, some from the UK and from uh, the Nordic countries. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks. So what we do know, however, when it comes to deaf blindness is that it's somewhat marginalized by social work. And here back in the 90s, Helen Louie was describing that when she says any social worker knows that difficulties in communication, independent functioning and self-esteem are psychosocial issues. We know that deafblindness cause all of these problems, 
but our profession has been curiously inactive in the field. Very few social workers specialize in it, and generalists, even those in aging, tend to give the issue less attention than it deserves. And it seems that this, uh, although Louis's writing back in the 90s, it seems that this is still the case, doesn't it? But it is very curious, I think, isn't it? If you think about the psychosocial impact of deaf blindness, and these, in, this impact is often more significant than the audiological and op ophthalmic matters, then why would social work neglect it? And yet it's often left to rehab workers, educationalists, um, uh, interpreters, communication professionals, and this is something of a problem. Yet I'm very passionate about social work with deaf blind people because I think social work has a lot to offer uh, the field uh, and that's what I want to talk about this evening. So next slide please. So how, what am I going to talk about this evening? Well, this is how I would see the social work contribution. There are six things I think that social workers can do that will help support deafblind people. Recognise and identify the impairment, the condition, acknowledge its impact, be legally literate, be creative, make use of mixed support, traditional and specialist, and refer on and work collaboratively. So I want to talk about those six things this evening uh, in a little bit more detail, thinking about what they actually mean. And when we talk about some of those things, we'll also be thinking about your skills, particularly your communication skills. And it may, what you may uh, reflect upon here is the skills that you already know, the skills that you've already learned, and think about how might I actually need to adapt these if I'm going to be working with deafblind people or a deafblind person. Next slide, please. So the first of these things, recognize and identify the impairment. So Louis, uh, as I've referred to all earlier, said social workers can help simply by appreciating and recognizing deaf blindness. So let's think about that a little bit more about recognizing deaf blindness. Next slide, please. So here's Michael Gawat. Michael Gawat um, works for the organization Deaf Blind UK and is himself deaf blind. And he says this, deaf blindness is the great unseen and unrecognized disability. It's quite telling, I think, when I used to tell people, what, what do you do? And I would say, oh, I'm a social worker for deaf blind people. And they would respond, oh, you're a social worker with deaf people and blind people. No, a social worker with deaf blind people. Um, I remember one woman was very indignant and said to me, well, you can't possibly be both. Um, so she didn't seem to acknowledge its, its very existence. Um, what we do know is deaf blindness is a complex impairment and deaf blind people have been described as some of the most disabled by the norms of society. Um, a society that's very centered, isn't it, on visual information and of course uh, on auditory information. We're bombarded all the time with um, auditory information and from what we see and receive visually. In a UK context, deaf blindness wasn't mentioned in the law until the 1970 Chronically Sick and Disabled Person Act, but then it was very much around the education of uh, uh, deaf blind children. It wasn't about social care in particular, and it wasn't really until 2001 that we see a change. Next slide, please. But thinking about this on a global scale, and why is it so important that we recognize deaf blindness? Um, back in 2018, the World Federation of the Deaf Blind produced the first ever global report on the situation and rights of persons with deaf blindness. Now, this drew on data from the largest ever population based study of deaf blind people, a review of the literature, and certain surveys. And what we know from this report is that from the data available, only 37% of countries officially recognize deaf blindness as a distinct disability. Now, uh, there's a slight change because in October 2020, the Chilean parliament uh, actually approved a bill 
recognizing uh, deaf blindness as a unique disability. So one more country added, but our work continues in trying to ensure that deaf blindness gets recognized as a unique impairment. Why is this so important that it's recognized as a unique impairment? Well, when it's not recognized, uh, things become, uh, deafblind people become invisible in terms of statistics and therefore in relation to policies, programs and services. Um, and of course, ultimately, therefore, it results in the exclusion of deafblind people. Next slide, please. So I want to think now about how do we recognize, how do we acknowledge and expand things a little bit more to think about how might you go about recognizing deaf blindness and why that can be sometimes quite difficult, but also important. If we think about deaf blindness, Donna Sauerberger, who's worked with deaf blind people for many years says this, we can never know what it's like to be both deaf and blind, unless we are. I believe it is both more awesome and less awesome than we actually imagine. Undoubtedly, we know there are descriptions of a loss of control for deaf blind people, social isolation and loneliness. And yet similarly, there are accounts of deaf blind people leading very active, lives. And one of the key things we need to avoid as social workers is making assumptions that deafblind people um, uh, lack agency or aren't capable themselves and that deafblind people are just in need rather than actual contributors to society. Next slide, please. So who are deafblind people? Well, some people have become part of the history, if you like, of deaf blindness um, and their lives are immortalized in books and in films um, and tell a tale of deaf blindness. They're part of deaf blind history, if you like. So Laura Bridgman here, born in 1829 and known as the first deaf blind person to be successfully educated in the English language. You may have heard of Laura Bridgman, possibly not, though I imagine more of you may have heard of Helen Keller. Helen Keller is the first deafblind person known to be educated to degree level um, in, in, in the English language. She is an American author, political activist and lecturer. And Helen Keller became deafblind when she was just 18 months old owing to illness. Um, and her life's been immortalized in films such as The Miracle Worker, telling the story of Anne Sullivan, the, the teacher that came uh, to educate Anne and stayed with her for the rest of Anne's life, um, which was uh, as a one-to-one -one support. For those of you who are fans of Bollywood films, the film Black clearly borrows from Helen Keller's story, but it's a fictional account and Rani, Rani Mukherjee plays a deafblind person. Uh, and plays that person rather well, I have to say. Alice Betteridge has been described as the Australian Helen Keller, again, a woman educated in Australia, um, a deafblind woman from early in life. So these people are really uh, part of deafblind history, but it's really important, important that we remain mindful of the fact that such people don't represent the majority of the deafblind population. Indeed, most deafblind people are not like these three people. Next slide, please. So I've just seen in the chat there, somebody mentioned Harb and Germa, and here's some more modern day deafblind people. And again, I think there's a clear message here that deafblind people aren't simply service users. Deafblind people are carers, social workers um, themselves. We can't always conceptualize deafblind people as service users and make huge contributions to the society in which we live. So we've got John Lee Clark, deafblind poet and author, Harbin Germer, deafblind woman who is the first graduate of Harvard Law School and is lawyer, speaker and author. Alexandra Adams, deafblind medical student based in the UK. Molly Watt, uh, motivational speaker herself, deafblind based here in the UK. Yeah. <sighs> 
So here's some deafblind people, but how would you as a social worker go about recognising deafblind people and why is it so important that we recognise it as a unique impairment? So let's think about that for a moment. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through some case studies now. And all I want you to think about is, is this person deafblind or not? That's all I need you to do. Is this person deafblind or not? So let's start with the first one. Next slide, please. Aisha. Aisha was born with congenital rubella syndrome. So her uh, mother during pregnancy contracted rubella and she was born with congenital rubella syndrome. She has very little hearing, although it's been difficult to assess. She has reduced vision, only being able to see about three foot ahead of her. Aisha can't mobilize without support and communication is established through hearing aids, large pictures and touch. Is Aisha deafblind? Have a think about that. Next slide, please. Matt. Matt is 28 years old. He was born profoundly deaf and uses British Sign Language. In his teens, he developed retinitis pigmentosa. This is a sight condition, which has affected his night vision and reduced his visual field. He can access BSL if it's directly in front of him, and he can read text messages, SMS messages on his mobile phone. But he doesn't go out alone in the evening when it is dark, as he has difficulty mobilizing safely. Is Matt deaf blind? Have a think about that. Next slide, please. Atul. Atul is 35. He has autism and learning disabilities. He has difficulties with speech and prefers to use Makaton. He lost an eye as a result of an accident in childhood and needs to scan when mobilizing and accessing Makaton. Is Atul deaf blind? Next slide, please. So our next character, Dalton. Dalton is 68. He was born with a moderate hearing loss and in his early 20s developed retinitis pigmentosa. His vision deteriorated to the point that he was registered severely sight impaired or in old language blind when he was in his 40s. Dalton uses speech and two hearing aids to communicate, although he struggles in groups and noisy environments. He uses audio to access permanent information and he mobilizes with a long cane or sighted guide. Would Dalton be considered deaf blind? And last, uh, not last slide, but next slide in terms of the last of our characters, Dora. Dora is 97 years old. Her vision has been affected by both macular degeneration, again, this is a sight condition, and cataracts. She can access large print with magnification. She describes herself as very hard of hearing, and she wears two hearing aids. She needs to be in a quiet room to hear clear speech. Is Dora deaf blind? Well, I hope what you've recognised simply by going through those characters, that people have very different experiences and very different needs. I don't know what answers you came up with, but congratulations if you noted that all but one of those people is deaf blind. The only one that wouldn't be considered deaf blind is Atul. And yet you will have recognized that very few, if any of these people were actually totally deaf or totally blind. So let's think about, well, what does the word deaf blind mean? We need to understand it, we need to define it if we as social workers are able to recognize it. Next slide, please. So defining what deaf blindness is, is actually rather complex. And there we see Jesper Damaya describing it as complex to define, complex to describe, and therefore complex to identify. The World Health Organization International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health even that was found limited when used as a tool in relation to identifying deaf blindness. And back in 2013, Walter Wittich and colleagues uh, undertook a systematic review of the literature uh, and found it littered with terms. That was their phrase. The research literature is littered with several terms to mean deaf blindness. <laughs> 
Perhaps part of the difficulty is that the term itself is misleading. Does it imply, for example, that people are only deaf blind if they are profoundly deaf and totally blind? And yet we know there are very few people who are profoundly deaf and totally blind. I've worked with deaf blind people for over 20 years now, and I can think of only two people who have been profoundly deaf and totally blind. Most people, like we've seen in the characters we've just been talking about, have some residual hearing and or vision. What we also know is that few people, particularly now I'm thinking about older people, use the term to describe themselves. They may describe themselves as dual sensory impaired or as having dual sensory loss. If they identify with the deaf community, they may identify as deaf with visual impairment or have hearing and vision difficulties. Of course, for some older people, they may in fact eschew any sort of label or category. And when we go out to meet them, perhaps carrying out assessments as a social worker or carrying out our work, rather than saying, oh, and I'm deaf blind, they may, for example, say, I have to have the TV on very loud and my daughter helps me read my mail. And yet we need to be aware of what it actually means and what it is. What we do know is a range of definitions and terms exist. In the USA, for example, there is a legal definition that tends to focus on clinical assessment i.e. visual acuity and audiometry. However, uh, a Nordic definition, so the Nordic countries, Scandinavia, Iceland and Finland, they uh, got together to produce the Nordic definition, which tends to focus on uh, functional difficulties. What difficulties does the impairment actually cause? That's central to the definition. And that's similar to what we find uh, in the UK. So how do we define deaf blindness here in the UK? Next slide, please. Well, you can see that the Department of Health, uh, as it was uh, in 1997, now, of course, the Department of Health and Social Care, which I think as social workers, we would always want to remind people when they talk about the Department of Health, that it's the Department of Health and Social Care. They drew on the work uh, back in the 1980s of the Deafblind Service li Liaison Group in order to come up with a definition. And you will see that the definition makes no reference to visual acuity, no reference to clinical measures, your vision has to be this poor, or no mention of audiograms, or that your hearing loss uh, or deafness has to be at this level. It doesn't make any reference whatsoever to clinical assessment. It purely focuses on function. And so the definition we have here in the UK is as follows. People are regarded as deaf blind if their sight and hearing impairment causes difficulty with three things, communication, access to information and mobility. So what we know here, uh, or I hope you recognize, is how this definition would apply to those characters that I spoke about earlier. As a result of sight and hearing impairment, um, and I'm using the language there that's in this document, Think Dual Sensory. I'm aware that uh, many people reject the idea of impairment, but that's the language we have currently in the law. If their sight and hearing impairment causes difficulty with these three things, communication, access to information and mobility, then the person is considered deaf blind no reference to medical assessment or uh, having to reach certain thresholds in terms of the amount of sight loss or the amount of hearing loss. It's about how the uh, combined effect of impairment results in difficulties in these three things. Next slide, please. And so by focusing on the impact that it has on function, we are recognizing deaf blindness as a third entity. It is a unique impairment. It is a third entity alongside deafness and blindness. And 
the whilst the experiences of deafblind people and the way in which their uh, deafness and visual impairment uh, or sight loss will affect them will be different, the thing that they often have in common is this idea of synergy. It is the combination of the two impairments that creates difficulty. Perhaps you've heard the phrase one plus one equals three. But I think a more colourful uh, approach that's given by a deafblind woman to explain this phenomena is, uh, is uh, offered by a deafblind woman who said this. If deafness is yellow and blindness is blue, if you put them together, you do not get yellow blue. You get green, a third distinct entity. And this is why the work of organisations campaigning for recognition of deaf blindness as a unique impairment has been so important. Because even a relatively minor impairment in hearing and or vision when taken alone could have a significant effect when seen in combination. For example, if I have a, uh, if I'm profoundly deaf or have a severe hearing loss and rely on lip reading to help me communicate, even a minor sight impairment is going to impact on me significantly. If I'm a visually impaired person and I rely on my hearing to safely navigate, perhaps crossing roads or getting out and about safely, even a relatively minor hearing impairment is going to create difficulties. It is the combination of the two. The combination of the two impairments means that one cannot compensate for the other. Why is this so important to us as social workers? Well, if we were to assess the person um, and see these two separate, we would view the minor impairment in, in one sense as insignificant, and we would overlook the combined impact. And this is why it's so important that we recognize deaf blindness as a unique uh, third category of sensory impairment. What this also means is that the number of people who would be considered deaf blind is actually a rather large group. And as a minority impairment, it's a minority impairment with an incredibly varied population. This is perhaps captured in the Copper Smith matrix. Next slide, please. So this uh, sort of helpful visual was designed by Ruth Coppersmith some years ago and presented at the Canadian Deaf Blind Conference. And here you can see, I think, uh, a sort of visual representation who may fall within that category of deaf blind. So you've got your sighted hearing people, but then um, I use the term normal advisory uh, cautiously there, but you, you see the point that's being made, that this would include, yes, at one end, people who are profoundly deaf and severely sight impaired blind, but it also includes those who are perhaps, uh, a word might be used, hard of hearing or hearing impaired, whichever people feel more comfortable with, and what used to be termed partially sighted, now termed sight impaired. This is a rather big group. Next slide, please. And because it's a big group, what we have to recognise is the experiences of deafblind people and therefore their needs and the way in which we as social workers respond to them is going to be very different. I'm sure you can already imagine that the characters we were talking about briefly before, Dalton and Dora and Matt and Aisha, have very different needs, albeit that they are all deafblind. And here's some of the um, things to think about when we're considering difference. The age of the person, but also importantly, the age of onset. Was the person born deafblind or have they become deafblind? And when did they become deafblind? What about the interval between the impairment in each sense? Did the person lose both their hearing and vision traumatically at the same time? Was the person born deaf and didn't lose their vision until much later in life? And there was a huge gap between the two, for example. 
What about the language and communication method of the person? Has the person grown up using sign language and is now starting to lose their vision? Or have they always used uh, oral communication, speech and hearing, and now they're losing their vision in later life? And what about their cultural backgrounds? This is just a few of the things that we need to think about when we're working with deafblind people. Others would include, are there any additional learning disabilities, for example, physical difficulties or cognitive impairment? Of course, all of these factors are important. To help us manage this, we have tended to view the impairment in two broad categories. Next slide, please. And so when we're talking about deaf blindness, we will often think about congenital deaf blindness and acquired deaf blindness. And this is what Jesper Damayer and others have done, breaking down the population into whether the impairment is congenital or acquired. So by congenital, we simply mean, of course, present at birth. This could have been issues during pregnancy or inherited conditions. And by acquired, it comes later in life after the acquisition of language. Now, there are significant differences between the experiences of those with congenital deaf blindness and acquired deaf blindness, which is why the distinction is important. For the congenital, congenitally deafblind child, for example, communication is particularly challenging because how does the deafblind child even know about the very concept of language, what language means, for example? For the person with acquired deafblindness who has perhaps spent their life in the hearing and uh, sighted world, how do they adapt to new ways of communicating? The needs are very different, but it's far more complex, of course, than this simple binary might suggest. For example, for the child who is born hearing sighted but loses their hearing and vision prior to the acquisition of language, they're more likely to function like somebody with congenital impairment. For someone, uh, for example, with Usher syndrome, this is a hereditary condition, congenital, but it causes acquired deaf blindness. And what about the experiences of people who have a congenital impairment in one sense and acquired impairment in the other? I think straight away we can see that this definition is a little bit inadequate really in capturing uh, the reality of deaf blind people's experiences. Next slide please. And so what we've done here in England is, and other countries, it's simply that this appears in the Department of Health uh, guidance. We've broken it down into groups of uh, diff different groups of deafblind people. And here uh, there are those five groups. Those that are deafblind from birth or early childhood, those who are visually impaired from birth and go on to acquire hearing impairment, those who are deaf from birth or early childhood and subsequently acquire visual impairment, those who are hearing impaired or deaf using oral communication. So that box in yellow there, I'm thinking about those who are British Sign Language or sign language users. Uh, in this green box, people who are hearing impaired or deaf using oral communication and go on to acquire a visual impairment. And that last group of people, people who acquire visual and hearing impairment in later life. Now, by far the biggest group of deafblind people is the group in this pink box. Those that acquire deafblindness later in life, perhaps as a result of age related conditions. Next slide, please. Oops, can we go back a few slides, please? We've jumped a few and back a bit more. Thank you. So, and next slide after this one, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
I mentioned there that the biggest group of deafblind people certainly is those who have acquired the impairment later in life, but it's actually very difficult for us to determine how many deafblind people there are. Partly because defining deaf blindness, as we've seen, is actually very difficult. Um, and partly because uh, surveys, censuses, for example, do not uh, list deaf blindness as a third category. They simply list blindness and deafness separately. And so you have to do a bit of cross referencing. However, the overall consensus is undoubtedly that prevalence increases with age. And because we're an aging population, the chances are that deaf blindness is going to, uh, the deaf blind population is going to grow. And I've just put some figures down there uh, if we were focusing on the UK, sort of 356,000. Now we're estimating around 400,000 deaf blind people uh, in the UK. The World Federation of Deaf Blind People report suggests 0.2% of the population are living with what they term severe deaf blindness, with 2% uh, milder forms. Next slide, please. So we've thought about how we might recognize deaf blindness. We also need to acknowledge its impairment. And I think this is particularly important if we're working with older people with acquired deaf blindness. Dual sensory impairment may be seen as simply a natural or a benign part of getting older by care workers, by family, by older people themselves. And this is something that we need to avoid. Deaf blindness may also be overshadowed when somebody presents with learning disabilities, for example. And so we really need to ensure that we have deaf blindness on our agenda. Next slide, please. What we do know is the psychosocial impact of deaf blindness can be significant. Communication difficulties, as you can imagine, the ongoing need to change, these aren't static. The impact it has on, a, on activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. Can we go back? Thank you. It has an impact on quality of life. The research picture in relation to mental health difficulties is um, mixed, although the picture appears to be emerging now uh, that there is a higher level of emotional and psychological and mental health problems amongst the deafblind community. And of course, we also know it has an impact on partners and family. Do think about there, for example, is there a need for a carer's assessment, for example, or are children acting as young carers and do they need support? Next slide, please. If we focus on communication for a moment, obviously we, I say obviously, uh, assumption there, we know that deaf blindness has a significant impact on somebody's communication strategies. But when we're thinking about assessment when it comes to communication strategies, we need to think about uh, how able and how willing is the person to learn new methods. If I've spent my entire life in the hearing sighted world and then somebody comes to me and says, we need to teach you new communication methods, that can be very difficult. And we need to think in assessment about the psychological impact of deaf blindness, not simply you're deaf blind now, learn this new method. Life isn't that straightforward. New communication methods can also be time consuming. And we know therefore that deaf blind people often receive very superficial communication. The assessment, the review by the social worker, everybody's involved and then the deaf blind person simply gets a summary at the end, which isn't best practice and isn't lawful practice if we think about the duty to involve in England under the CARE Act, for example. We've been very fortunate to be joined by interpreters this evening, but when it comes to deaf blindness, we do know of a shortage of interpreters. Very few interpreters registered with the appropriate body with the required skills across the UK. And so deaf blind people waiting uh, weeks on end to get appointments because of difficulties accessing interpreters. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
And you can imagine the wider implications that this would have on the deafblind person in relation to communication, increased social isolation and loss of independence and control. We know evidence of misdiagnosis and inappropriate treatment. There I'm thinking in a mental health context and reduced involvement in decision-making and queries raised about people's capacity to make decisions when really this is simply an issue around communication and somebody requiring communication support, not indicative of a lack of capacity. Next slide, please. So I want you to think for a moment about the core communication skills that you have developed and learnt about, or indeed if in practice on placement or qualified that you use so far. And in what ways might you need to adapt them when you're working with deafblind people? Go away and have a think about that, but just to give you some examples, the use of silence can be really powerful, can't it, in social work. Sometimes the best response is silence. Perhaps the person needs more time to think through their response, particularly, and as we know as social workers, we spend a lot of time doing this, our conversations are often about very sensitive topics. But how does the role of silence work when I'm with the deaf blind person? Does it leave the service user thinking, are they still there? Have they gone? We know we use facial communication and body language to indicate that we're listening, to indicate or express empathy or concern. But how effective is non-touch based communication? The smile, the look of concern to the deaf blind person. We tend to perhaps lower our voice slowly, uh, slightly, I beg your pardon, if we're talking about a particularly sensitive topic. Again, how effective is that going to be for the person who is deaf, blind or dual sensory impaired? We are going to need to adapt and change. Next slide, please. So one of the questions I'm often asked when people know I work with deaf, blind people is, well, how do you communicate with deaf, blind people? Well, there's an array of ways of communicating with deaf, blind people. Some have even said there are many ways of communicating with deaf, blind people as there are deaf blind people. But here's just an overview of some of them. We're really scratching the service this evening because there's lots of things to talk about. But here's some of the ways in which deaf blind com people communicate. I mentioned before that for many deaf blind people, they have residual hearing and or vision. And so making use and maximizing that can be helpful. Perhaps making use of clear speech, lip reading for those that have some uh, residual vision and hearing aids, for example. For some people who are using sign language, but their visual uh, acuity, their visual field, I beg your pardon, not their acuity, their visual field is reduced, we may use what's called visual frame signing. In this instance, the signer imagines, Haley's just done that lovely as the interpreter, imagines a frame this is point, this is drawing out effectively the field of vision that the deaf blind person still has and the signer then signs within that imaginary frame. Tadoma is a rather more rare form of communication and again in all my years whilst I've seen it in use I've never personally worked with any deaf blind person using Tadoma. Tadoma was developed at a time when uh, oral communication was pushed and sign language was somewhat suppressed. And it's actually a form of tactile lip reading. So I don't know if you can tell in the picture there what's going on, but effectively the deaf blind person is placing their thumb on the lips of the speaker, their finger along the jawline and the other fingers on the vocal cords. And by feeling the movement of the lips, the movement of the jaw and the vibration of the vocal cords, the person uh, lip reads. Uh, it's named after two children to, uh, who were taught this tactile approach to uh, lip reading uh, back in the 1920s. And their names, as you can perhaps guess, were Tad Chapman and Omer Simpson, hence Tad Omer. Um, just as a point of clarity, Omer Simpson, not Homer Simpson, who is somebody entirely different. Next slide, please. 
Where we can't make use of uh, residual hearing or vision, or we're in an environment, perhaps a noisier environment where that becomes difficult, then our communication is going to need to be what we would call tactual or touch-based. Now, I can guarantee that this first one you're already going to be pretty good at, perhaps without realising. Although I would encourage you uh, and I can send out as resources a guide to doing block alphabet. But block alphabet is essentially, as it says on the tin, the speaker uses their finger like a pen and draws block capital letters on the hand of the deafblind person who receives the information. And so words are spelt out. Each letter is written on the hand, one over the other, and words are spelt out. Now you can try this yourself, um, but what we know is that those that have grown up uh, hearing and sighted, the alphabet is familiar to them. And so this can be a relatively easier way of learning communication. But of course, it can be rather slow if you imagine spelling every word out. Ordinarily, it's done on the hand of the deafblind person, though it can be done on the arm or on the person's back. Deafblind manual borrows to an extent from British Sign Language finger spelling. Again, the words are spelled out and various touch and symbols on the hand indicate each of the letters of the alphabet. However, this can be much quicker than block alphabet in communicating um, uh, speech. Um, and I've even seen uh, deafblind people have two deafblind manuals communicating with them, one on each hand. One is interpreting what is being said. The other is describing what is going on around them. But of course, block alphabet and deafblind manual are English based. And if I've grown up with British Sign Language or Sign Language as my first language, uh, my abilities in English may not be as strong. It's a second language. And so sign language is more familiar to me. But if I'm losing my vision such that I can no longer access sign language visually, then I may use what's called hands-on or tactile sign language. The signs are no longer seen they are felt. And you can see that in the picture there. But with some of these communication strategies, uh, particularly if we think about deafblind manual or block alphabet, whilst that can convey what is being said, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to convey the emotion of what's being said? Is it sarcasm or not? Uh, and also what is going on around me. And so that's where we might make use of what's called haptic communication. Haptic communication is a system of tactile signs, and this is used to describe the environment, emotional responses, descriptions of people, and other additional information going on that would ordinarily be gained by the person through their vision. The signs are usually drawn on the person's back, and you can see that uh, hopefully in the picture there. And this system originated in Finland. It was created by Dr. Rita uh, Latinen and Russ Palmer. Signs are drawn on the back or, uh, of the person to indicate laughter, anger, excitement. For example, if I was to deafblind manual to somebody, would you like a coffee? What is the actual meaning of that? Do I mean, would you like a coffee to drink? Or am I actually being rather more flirtatious and inviting the person to something other than a coffee? How do I know that if I can't pick up on the visual clues or the tone? If I'm a deafblind person presenting, how do I know that the audience are laughing at the joke I've just made? How do I know the direction of the person asking me a question? How do I know that two people in this review meeting I'm having haven't just got up and walked out? I need to have access to that information. Everybody else doesn't need to be told because they receive that as information visually. Haptic communication is a way of expressing that 
to me. Now, if you want to see a lovely example of this, have a look on YouTube. I can send out the link. There's um, a video of a young deaf blind boy um, who's watching a football match. In front of him is a Sabutio type table so he can follow the position of the players. Using tactile sign language, Brazilian sign language presumably, the interpreter is signing to him the words of the commentator. The haptic communicator behind him on his back is conveying the visual information and the mood of the game. She conveys to him the excitement as a goal is about to score. She explains to him that the spectators are getting up on their feet. She's explaining all these different things. And so it conveys information that people should be told in order to be fully included. Next slide, please. What I didn't mention was objects of reference. This again is a system that can be used with deafblind people, including deafblind people who have perhaps got additional learning difficulties or learning disabilities. This is where an object is felt and used to indicate meaning. Perhaps, for example, uh, handing someone a towel is an indicator that we're going to go swimming now or you're going to have a bath. Handing somebody a mug, they feel the mug and through that create meaning, i.e. we're going to have a drink or would you like a drink, for example. Now, I'm very conscious of time and I wanted to talk about some communication challenges, uh, Bertha and Daniel, but I'm going to send out those case scenarios as the resources at the end of this seminar, simply so we can carry on. But this is uh, some challenges for you to think about how you'd establish communication with people in certain circumstances. So if I can ask to go to the next slide, please, to really start thinking about the complexities here. So Femke Krieger is a Dutch woman, there's her picture of Femke, a uh, deafblind woman who said this in her piece about her experiences as a deafblind woman using social work services. The relationship between the deafblind client and the social worker carries a very complex interaction. What does she mean by this? Well, she describes how deaf blindness is one, one factor and only one factor of her identity. She is Femke, a person with her own identity, likes, dislikes, uh, a unique human being. She's not deaf blindness on legs or walking deaf blindness. And this is the first point she wants to make. But the second, and this is where the complexity comes, is the very nature of the relationship, which is more tactile than perhaps would be ordinary in social work client interventions. We know uh, that self-disclosure is a rather complex topic, don't we, when it comes to social work. Next slide, please. But I want to think about this for a moment, thinking about professional boundaries, self-disclosure and un unintended self-disclosure. We know that um, we don't really talk about ourselves as social workers. It's not about us. We shouldn't be self-disclosing too much in that interaction. But I want to you to picture yourself now doing a home visit. We do less of that at the moment, don't we, in the current pandemic. But just imagine a home visit. And I'm going to put myself in that position. If I go and do a home visit to an older person, older service user, I've gone perhaps to do an assessment, for example. It's not about me. I am a professional. I'm not the person's friend. And so I wouldn't self-disclose things. It would be inappropriate. But I do self-disclose things all the time, perhaps unintentionally. When I knock on the door of that person and the person opens the door, the service user, they immediately know uh, that I'm male, that I have a beard. They can probably have a guess at my age. They may observe that I have a wedding ring on. And so now they know that I'm married. And perhaps by my uh, mannerisms and by my tone of voice, they may guess that I'm married to a man and not a woman. 
all of that information I've given out, I haven't intended to, I've simply given it out. But I haven't given that, uh, but I wouldn't give that information away to a deaf blind person because it's visual. Does that mean I have to tell the deaf blind person that information? Do they have a right to know that information? Why should the deaf blind service user not know things about me that the non deaf blind service user doesn't know? I don't have an easy answer to that question, but it's very interesting for us to think about, isn't it? The flip side of this, Femke gives a very interesting uh, story of when the social worker, remember, they're touching each other. Very interesting for me, of course, when people say about touch and we shouldn't touch service users. If I didn't touch my service users, they wouldn't have known I was there. This is how we communicated. But Femke describes the social worker physically guiding her. Um, she needs a sighted guide walking around. And she says to the social worker, what's wrong with you? The social worker replies, nothing wrong with you. There is, I can tell, I can feel it. I can feel tension while you're holding me. I can feel it in your uh, body language. I can pick up on it. And she was right. The social worker was having a, a particularly difficult day that day. And through a very close relationship, a touch-based relationship, she'd given that information away. I think we can see, can't we, why the relationship between the social worker and the deaf mind person is a rather complex interaction. So let's think about the role of touch for a moment, because this is very important. Next slide, please. For those of you based in the UK, I do feel like it's my uh, Chris Whitty moment saying next slide, please, as if I'm that important, uh, but I'm not. But anyway, uh, I'm enjoying having... Uh, the next slide, please. And I'm very grateful to colleagues for moving through the slides for me. But if we can go back one, please. Thank you. So touch. Akika, uh, Akika Fukuda, who is a deafblind woman herself, notes that touch is important to all deafblind people. We know this. And whether they are using tactile communication or not, touch is still important to all deafblind people. Touch is the first sensation that starts evolving in the womb at just five weeks. It's almost as if biologically we're programmed for touch to be the most important sense to all of us. But how often do you use touch on how much do you rely on your hearing and vision instead? But when we think about touch, I want to think of for a moment about what we've called tactile defensiveness. So tactile defensiveness is when someone has a negative reaction to being touched by another person, by an object, by something that comes into contact with their skin. This makes them defensive about anything, uh, anybody touching them. Perhaps if I give you an example, however, if I was to hand a box to you, I wouldn't do this, it'd be weird. But if I was to hand a box to you and said, put your hand in here and it felt funny or strange to you, what would your immediate reaction be? You'd probably withdraw your hand. Oh, what's that? It feels funny. We don't always like to touch what we can't see. But of course, if we're working with a deafblind child and they're tactile defensive, we have to break that down because how are professionals, family, anyone going to communicate with the child if they're tactile defensive? But this raises another challenge, doesn't it, in practice. If we've broken down tactile defensiveness, what we do know is that deafblind children are touched more than societal norms, and they become used to therefore being touched, by more people uh, than societal norms in more intimate ways. But this, of course, raises all sorts of vulnerabilities and risk, doesn't it? How does the deafblind child know the difference between appropriate and inappropriate touch? So when we think about safeguarding and protection, the deafblind child may have difficulty disclosing abuse because they have very few communication partners within which to have that uh, conversation. However, the deafblind child might not even know there's anything to disclose because it's simply a physical experience they've had and not understood or experienced as abusive 
So all sorts of difficulties. Of course, it also raises vulnerability, doesn't it, for the worker. If we're engaging in touch with deafblind service users, it can render us in a vulnerable position. Could our touch be misinterpreted as sexual in some way or inappropriate? Imagine, for example, that you're working with a deafblind uh, male in adolescent years going through puberty. They may well respond sexually to your touch, albeit that your touch is of a non-sexual nature. This puts you now in a very vulnerable position yourself, doesn't it? But again, when you're doing assessments, if you're thinking about and exploring with somebody with acquired deaf blindness now, and you want to say, look, we know your condition is going to deteriorate. We know that you're going to have difficulties in the future hearing speech or being able to access printed materials. Um, we may need to explore with you and support you to learn tactile communication, but it's not simply about ability to learn and the time it is needed to learn, but also we have to think about within our assessment, how comfortable are people with touch? Think yourself, are you in a touchy-feely family or not? And this is going to be part of our assessment into how much support the person may need in order to engage with tactile based communication. I remember one gentleman who I was uh, uh, supporting him to learn some tactile communication. When I went to see him the following week, he was very honest and said, look, when you came last week and started to talk about deaf blind manual, I thought to myself, who's this weirdo? What's all this about? But actually it's quite helpful. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing social work can offer is legal literacy. We know, don't we, that a strength of social work in a multidisciplinary team is the legal literacy that social workers bring with them. So what does the law say about deaf blindness? Well, apologies to our listeners who aren't in England. I'm going to focus on England only, uh, I'm afraid, this evening. But I'd really encourage you to look at the provision in your own country. Next slide, please. So here in England, it's rather a robust legal framework that we have now. So, and what I've put on this slide is the key legislative provision uh, and, uh, outside of the primary legislation, the um, secondary legislation and policy guidance relevant to deafblind children and adults. So we have the care and support assessment regulations, so that's secondary legislation. Um, we have the care and support statutory guidance issued under the CARE Act. Oh, excuse me. And we have the care and support for deafblind children and adult policy guidance. And we can send out the links to all these documents if people want to have a look at them. In the care and support statutory guidance, deaf blindness is mentioned more than 20 times. And so this is absolute uh, credit to deafblind people and deafblind organisations who campaigned very hard during the passing of the CARE Act in Parliament. And so we see, as I've mentioned, deafblindness is mentioned over 20 times in that document. So I don't have time this evening to go through all of that, but I just want to talk about the Care and Support Assessment Regulations, paragraph six. So next slide, please. What does it say? So remember, this is regulations. So this is secondary legislation. It has the full force of the law. And it says this, an assessment which relates to an individual who is deaf blind must be carried out by a person who has specific training and expertise relating to individuals who are deaf blind. So let's go back to that first point I mentioned recognize and identify deaf blindness. If I'm out doing a needs assessment, and as a result of that, I identify that this older person is deaf blind, they simply have difficulty with those three things as a result of their hearing and sight loss, then they're now entitled to specialist assessment. And it may be therefore that 
I am not suitably qualified to carry it out and I'm going to have to refer on. The local authority can do that in-house. They may have people trained or they may have to commission it from someone else. So this is another reason why it's so important as social workers that you identify deaf blindness, particularly, I think, amongst older people who may not recognise it themselves, because by recognising it, they're now entitled to specialist assessment and specialist support. Now, the care and support statutory guidance outlines um, uh, what that level of qualification must be. Now, as a minimum, it needs to be level three, um, but for, uh, and some local authorities are training their staff up at level three, but for some deaf blind people, level three simply wouldn't be enough, and we need somebody with level four or level five qualifications. Next slide, please. So the care and support for deafblind children and adults policy guidance sets out what local authorities must do. Now, again, a little bit like the care and support statutory guidance in England, this guidance is issued, un well, jointly, it's issued under the Care Act in relation to adults, and it's issued under the Local Authority Social Services Act in relation to children. But it sets out the actions that the local authority must take in response to deafblind children and adults and their social care. So we see their identification of deafblind people in their area and keeping a record. Ensure that assessment is carried out by someone with the specific training to do so. Ensure that deafblind people are, uh, services are appropriate. And this particularly picks up on the point that single sensory services, services for visually impaired and deaf people may not be suitable for dual sensory impaired and deafblind people. Local authorities must ensure that deafblind people are able to access specifically trained one-to-one -one support workers, that information is accessible, and that somebody at director level uh, has overall responsibility for deafblind people. So I need to start bringing this to an end now. So let's think about those last few points that we can offer as social workers. Next slide, please. For me, one of the absolute joys of working with deafblind people was that I felt I could really get back to being a social worker and using all those social work skills that there's no doubt in my mind that uh, those joining this webinar tonight have, our creativity and our approach to problem solving. This, for me, was the joy of working with deafblind people. Next slide, please. Because what it meant is that I often had to transcend assessment and care management processes and really engage in direct work. Very rarely are there off the peg solutions for deaf blind people. And it means that I'm going to have to engage in creative problem solving. How are we going to work it out? We might make use of a range of technologies. Now, Whilst that might be specialist technology, and we're seeing all sorts of those, sometimes it can be very mainstream technology, sometimes it can be very simple strategies. We might make use of fridge magnets on a large metal frame, big coloured letters to spell words out that people can view. One example of creativity from my own practice, a deaf blind woman living alone who couldn't hear the doorbell. Now, yes, we could have put in uh, a key safe, you know, these little things that go outside and the care workers could have let themselves in. But is that really appropriate? Is that fair? Is that promoting somebody's independence? The woman could get to the door. She just couldn't access the doorbell. A key safe doesn't really seem the most appropriate way forward, does it? We tried amplified doorbells and these are often available but she couldn't access them. Her hearing loss was such she couldn't hear it. We therefore tried flashing doorbells, flashing lights, but her vision was such that she couldn't see that. Oops, I'm getting some feedback. Thank you. So what do we do? Well, we have to be creative. And so myself and the technical officer for the deaf, my colleague, we worked with a local electrician 
uh, and we got her doorbell wired up to an electric fan next to the chair where she sat. So when the doorbell was pressed, she felt the wafting of the air. Oh, someone's at the door. She answered it. And this, there's many examples of that sort of activity. There was a uh, colleague of mine that always, when she entered the room, when she visited a particularly deafblind person, she sprayed her perfume as she walked in. Not only now does the deafblind person know that somebody's entered the room, she knew who it was because she recognised the perfume. Leaving potpourri in different rooms in the residential home so people can locate where they are. There's all sorts of creative things we can do. And there's also some very simple but effective uh, interventions. You'd be amazed at the difference it can make if we simply clean someone's glasses so that they can uh, access lip reading, so that we support them with their hearing aids, that we, instead of serving white cod with mashed potato on a white plate, on a white mat with a white tablecloth, we introduce some colour contrast to make life a lot easier. These are very simple but effective interventions. We may want to make use of direct payments, but of course we will be arguing for increased personal budget allowances because of the cost of one-to-one -one specialist support. I spent a lot of my time arguing uh, for an increased rate of direct payment. We can't expect the deafblind person to commission support at that level if we couldn't commission it as a local authority ourselves, and so we make arguments for that. But I think this one in blue is absolutely essential for deafblind people, and this very much came from my own PhD research, recognising that one of the things that my participants um, felt vulnerable to was being seen as incompetent or incapable because they were deafblind. And so avoiding low expectations, I think, is very important when we're working with deafblind people. Next slide, please. And the last thing we can do is refer on and work collaboratively. We know that very rarely, uh, sorry, often is the case, get this the right way around, often is the case that deafblind people need a multi-agency response. Um, and it's rather unfortunate, I think, that much of the legal responsibility is placed on social services and social services alone. And therefore, we need to refer on and work collaboratively. Next slide, please. And I've simply listed here a number of the professionals that you may find yourself working with when you are working in this field. Colleagues in health, colleagues in education, communication professionals, and if you're unsure on their particular roles there, do ask that question. Next slide, please. Social services within your own organisation, if you're in a local authority, there will be specialist social workers or maybe technical officers for the deaf and rehabilitation officers for those with visual impairment. You might be working with support staff, communicator guides. Communicator guides is the name uh, of people that act really as the eyes and ears of deafblind people supporting them to do day-to-day -day activities, making phone calls um, and guiding people out and about to enjoy their lives. And of course, specialist organisations uh, on an international level, Sense International, but also Sense UK, Deafblind UK and local organisations as well. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Well, these are some of the key priorities now in this field for both practice and research. Older deafblind people, we're an ageing population and there's consensus that deafblindness, uh, the prevalence of deafblindness increases with age. And so, uh, although the provenance of these campaigning organisations and early research focused on deafblind children uh, and their education, we really need to start thinking about older deafblind people. And of course, those older deafblind, those deafblind children, many of whom were born during, I mean, interesting, isn't it, a pandemic, the rubella pandemic of the 50s and 60s, they are getting older. They are living their lives and entering uh, later life. So older deafblind people need to be a focus. We need to develop our screening tools to help us identify acquired dual sensory loss. 
we need to think increasingly about assistive technologies and the role that they will play and are playing in the lives of deafblind people. We need to take an integrated interdisciplinary approach in this field. And one thing that still eludes us as researchers is establishing the breaking point. I've talked about um, deaf blindness is the inability of one in uh, sense to compensate uh, for the other. At what point does impairment in one become such that that difficulty compensating happens? My own research identifies that it's not simply about the two impairments, of course, interacting, but the environment very much reflecting, I think, a social model of disability. Next slide, please. So the next slides are simply some reading that you may want to have a look at, some of my own work and some work uh, by other colleagues. And I think I've been glancing at the chat. I No way have I kept up with it. I'm afraid I can't. Um, but there have been a lot of questions about COVID-19. And of course, this has been created huge difficulties for deafblind people uh, who are tactile. And so my piece, when physical distancing means losing touch, um, is available freely there, where I'm talking about um, this discussion, uh, you know, this move towards, well, we shouldn't socially distance, we should physically distance. Well, the two and, uh, aren't so easy to separate uh, when I'm a deafblind person. Next slide, please. Some more reading there again, the World Federation report and some work that myself and Walter Wittich have done about aging and combined deaf blindness. Next slide, please. So here's some organizations. You can have a look at them online, Deafblind International, Sense, Deafblind UK, and the National Consortium on Deaf Blindness. Next slide, please. And for some uh, user perspectives, there's some blogs there listed, Deafblind Interact, Deafblind and Determined and Journey of a Deafblind Mum. Uh, this is deafblind people uh, talking about their lives and user-led organizations. So the World Federation of Deafblind, the European Deafblind Union, and the European Deafblind Network. Next slide, please. So I've only gone slightly over time and I uh, hope you've managed to bear with me and thank you for staying with me. But thank you for listening. We've scratched the surface of deafblindness, but I do hope it's been of interest to you. Um, 